Okay, Valerius Kopens, thank you so much for uh, for uh, doing this interview. I really appreciate it. Hi, George. Uh, well, uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Well, um, so um, Tra Traven in introduced us, um, and you know, you're working on something called Obite. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, most people will probably know it as Bitepool. That's what yeah, yeah. But it's the the new name is Obite, which is yeah. The new uh, name is Obite. Yeah, a, that's all right. right. A DAG based coin. Um, but before we get into that, um, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into crypto in the first place? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm uh, 44 years old, uh, girlfriend and two kids. I live in the Netherlands. And um, my career basically started in uh, the internet, in the early days of the internet. Mm -hmm. I started out as a web designer. And um, I basically left university to become a web designer. I loved it that much. I was mm -hmm. totally blown away by, by the internet. And um, I made a career there. I became manager of uh, web designers. And from there on out, I became a director of a business unit that made websites. And actually, I managed a pretty big download portal, mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, of the time. Um, but then the internet bubble burst. And uh, I thought, uh, well, maybe I should do something else. <clears throat> and I started working uh, mm -hmm. in finance at an insurance company. First as an internal consultant, and uh, there I made career as well. Mm -hmm. Became a functional design manager, then IT manager, and then after a couple of years, uh, director of IT, uh, mm -hmm. of a whole insurance group. And then when I was working there, I did a lot uh, of strategy work and innovation. And um, I had a, a thing called the Innovation Circle, and that's why we invited interesting people uh, to, to tell about basically what was going on in the world, uh, the, the major trends. And uh, that's how I discovered Bitcoin. That was in 2011. And uh, one of these guys, a German, um, he uh, started telling about this new digital gold called Bitcoin. And uh, I was intrigued by it. So mm -hmm. um, when I got home, I started Googling and uh, I downloaded the mining software. And I started mining. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my iMac at the time uh, couldn't handle it, and uh, it crashed every night. So I never managed to mine a single Bitcoin. But um, so I basically gave up. And um, then uh, I think it was 2014, so three years later, it came back in the news because of the, the Mt. Gox scandal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought, oh, wait, this uh, thing is still around. So it survived for three years, and basically it, it got above $1,000. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. I should look into this again. And it kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And I thought, well, uh, if it survived this long, um, this is something, it's, it's probably going to be big. And I started, uh, well, just buying one at a time, basically. That's how I got into crypto. And um, <clears throat> uh, fast forward a couple of years, I was still working at this insurance company, but in the early 2017, a friend of mine uh, said, uh, Valerius, you should really look into Bitepool. You should check it out, read the white paper. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. At first, uh, I, I basically dismissed it because I thought, what a crazy name. It sounds like Powerball, uh, like a lottery. I'm mm -hmm. not going to look into it. And then a couple months later, he asked me, well, did you, did you read the white paper? Because uh, you really should. And I said, sorry, I didn't do it. But if you insist, then... Um, I'll check it out anyway. And so I did. And I was even more blown away by it than the Bitcoin white paper. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think the founder, Anton Churyumov, he has, um, he made a brilliant balance between centralization and decentralization. Um, and uh, you know, we'll talk some more about it later, I guess, about the DAG and why that design is so beautiful. But uh, I really, really liked it. And, um, I, well, I started checking out their Slack and uh, all their social channels. And I basically just started volunteering, mm -hmm. um, helping other people out, uh, write some articles, etc. And uh, I did that for a couple of months. And um, at the time, I uh, was trying to build uh, one of the biggest uh, used car sales platforms in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. which is now live. But... Um, <laughs> I was doing that, uh, but in all my spare time, I was spending on Bitepool. 
And then at some point I thought, well, uh, once this platform is built, then uh, it has to be marketed and sales and stuff. And that, that's not what I like. Mm-hmm. And uh, I noticed that I, w- I was having way more fun doing stuff for Bipol. So I just wrote Anton a letter uh, saying, uh, look, these are my qualifications. This is what I can do. This is how I think I can help the project out. And, and um, well, he basically uh, said, uh, you're welcome to join. And that's what uh, I did uh, last year in June. I, I joined the project. Basically uh, trying to get some structure in it um, and uh, coming up with a strategy for, for adoption, basically, because if you look at the whole crypto space, then that is what is lacking at the moment. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of stuff is being built, but hardly anybody is using it. Even the biggest projects, uh, one of my favorite projects I always talk about it is Augur on mm-hmm. Ethereum, mm-hmm. the prediction market. Yep. Uh, but it, it hardly has any users. And um, that, that's the huge challenge. So technology-wise, there is a lot of stuff, but uh, we have to figure out a way to make people use it. So that's a short history of my career and how I got into Bipol. Now cool. Over. Cool. Very cool. So, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I think is super interesting about, uh, about Byteball or, or Obyte now is the, uh, the directed acyclical graph, right? The DAG mm-hmm. basically. And, yeah. um, one of the things that, that I find kind of curious about Byteball and and also um, IOTA and some of the other DAG-based uh, cryptocurrencies is this choice to have uh, predetermined witnesses, right? So, yeah. like, I, I, I know that um, in Ethereum, which is uh, the second most popular um, crypto well it's not really a cryptocurrency it's more of a smart contract platform but yeah. i actually i like it primarily as a cryptocurrency because they're implementing uh sharding right yeah. but dags are just really a different form of sharding which are somewhat more elegant but um it, it's this this design choice to have these these predetermined kind of central authorities that witness transactions. Can you talk a little bit about that? Can, first of all, can you explain what a DAG is and um, why, yeah. why it's better or why it's not, I won't say better because that's, that's very biased. I think okay. it's cool. I think it's a very interesting technology. It's certainly newer than blockchain. Um, but why, why, why do you like uh, DAGs uh, over blockchains, for example. Yeah, well, it, it has different advantages and disadvantages. So, um, the, the, the misconceptions about witnesses, I'll I'll talk to uh, to you about that in a second. But uh, mm-hmm. first, uh, uh, about DAG. Basically, any bo- blockchain is also a DAG. Mm-hmm. So, inside a block is a DAG. That's basically mm-hmm. the way to look at it. And the difference between a <clears throat> uh, a DAG like Obytes and uh, the blockchain in Bitcoin, for instance is that in Bitcoin, there are gatekeepers called miners, and those Mm -hmm. miners decide which transactions go into which block. Right. Um, And uh, a DAG doesn't have any blocks. So all users in the network are equal. You don't have like a regular user and a miner. All users Mm -hmm. are the same. So everybody is allowed to uh, write transactions into the DAG immediately. You don't have to wait for a block producer to basically approve your transaction. Mm-hmm. What this means is because the security in Bitcoin is derived from this mining algorithm. There is this proof of work to make sure that you don't have double spends. Otherwise, with uh, zero confirmation, you could also write directly into uh, a blockchain. But then uh, there is no way to know if there is a double spend. It's right. almost the same in, in a direct today cyclic graph. And you have to have a way to make sure that nobody is doing double spends. And that's why we have these witnesses. And basically these witnesses are just the same as any other full node in the network. Mm -hmm. And they do exactly uh, what the label says. They witness transactions for the rest of the users to uh, basically know what the right path in the DAC is. That's Mm -hmm. what we call a main chain. And um, well, there are 12 witnesses in Obyte and that's basically a somewhat arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. It could have also been 20 or 100 or five. 
um, but 12 was picked because uh, it's a sufficiently low number that you could know all 12 witnesses. Mm -hmm. And that's important because uh, there is no proof of stake in the native currency like in Ethereum, for instance, what they're planning to do. Mm -hmm. um, the, the stake that witnesses have is their reputation in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes it uh, totally different from any other uh, crypto. Um, but these witnesses, they only witness other transactions. And once a majority of the witnesses has done that, then other users can know for sure that this branch of the DAC is the real one because the majority of witnesses has seen it. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one, of the issues, one of the issues that, that I, I have with, with the idea of having real-world identities associated to all of the central signing authorities, essentially, mm -hmm. right, which is what they are, is no, no, they don't sign. They, well, they I, I, I understand. They, 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 they verify. They validate. Right. So just as signing. any other full node. Right. Exactly. But um, one of the issues with knowing who all of the witnesses are is that if one were so inclined, like like a central authority, like an incumbent, like a let's say a, a malicious government, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say. Um, uh, the Chinese government or, or yeah. you know, the, the U.S. IRS mm. or uh, let's say that the European uh, government in Belgium became somehow fascist and they decided to arrest all of these 12 people, right? If they are known people, um, that, that, that poses a problem, right? B basically, if you shut down those 12 witnesses, you shut down the network. Well, it depends how they set up their security for their witness node. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you could then, if they were all apprehended at the same time mm -hmm. worldwide, so it's uh, like a huge uh, coordinated action to apprehend them all. Uh, to apprehend 12 people. At the same time. Yeah, that would stop the network, but you couldn't change any transaction in the network up to that point. Right. The only thing you would achieve then is that uh, new transactions are just not confirmed anymore. Right. So that, of course, would be a disaster, but it's not... Anything that ever happened on the DAC will not change. That's impossible. So even if, even if you do apprehend them. And um, the network could just be forked with 12 new witnesses from that point onwards. Mm -hmm. um, but still, uh, that, that would be devastating. I mean, if the world economy was, even a fraction of the world economy was running on the Obite platform, that, that of course would be devastating. Mm -hmm. But the design of Obite um, has in mind that you, that, that, eventually if we do get adoption that it will be together with financial institutions so this is not um uh, this is not a, as extreme as bitcoin is in, in a sense the, the whole design of the network and the platform is with uh, cooperation with the existing world uh, in mind so building bridges between the real world and the crypto world so mm -hmm. to speak but um, i mean wh why 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 not why not simply implement a design where you can have fully pseudo anonymous people like like if if you have stakeholders that value the cryptocurrency right like like if this cryptocurrency um you know to buy it i mean it costs let's say a thousand dollars a coin or something like that right like like these people they don't want to burn their their stake in that cryptocurrency so it's not necessary to in my view, I mean, I don't see, I don't, it's not immediately obvious to me what the, what the necessity is to tie uh, the, the witnesses to real world uh, assets or real world identities. Because, um, and, and also, why, why do these people have to be static? Why can't anyone who wants to just throw their hat in the ring and say, I'm ready to be a witness. I'm, I'm ready to store transaction histories and witness transactions. So if you want me to witness your transaction, let me know. I'm available for that, right? Like, so maybe um, not, not all witnesses have to witness all transactions as long as the network is able to verify that all transactions have been witnessed and that there is a... Uh, 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 a complete uh, reconstitutable transaction history on some kind of storage media, like let's say IPFS or, or something like that, right? So that we know that all of the transactions have been verified. And if ever 
the verification. Uh, if ever some of the 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 compute the nodes get shut down, people can see oh there's there's less replication of each transaction confirmation. So I'm going to reconfirm some of these old transactions. And again, you can maintain the the consistency of of the network in a fully decentralized way. Well, actually, that's almost how it works because anybody who runs a full node can say to the world, "Hello, I'm running a full node. I want to be a witness." And it's actual users who decide which 12 witnesses they want to pick as their witnesses. Okay. Uh, but only uh, the, the, the protocol is designed in a way that you can only change one at a time. So uh, 11 of the 12 witnesses have to be the same as in the previous transaction, and then mm -hmm. you can change one witness. So eventually, at, at the moment, um, 11 out of 12 witnesses are still run by the founder, Tony. There's only one truly decentralized witness at the moment, but there will be more and more and more, and eventually all 12 will be decentralized. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to the 13th witness to say, okay, I think I'm a better witness on number eight, uh, mm -hmm. and he's going to start a campaign. Look, uh, dear users, I think I'm better because blah, blah, blah. And then users can decide um, if they want to change out another witness. Mm -hmm. um, but in effect, all full nodes do the work you just described. So they're all verifying the transactions, not just the witnesses. The only difference is that the main chain, so that the, basically the reference point for all users, um, that can only advance once a majority of the witnesses has seen a transaction. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a big difference between verify and see. Okay. All the full notes are technical, technologically exactly the same as a witness. There is no difference. So um, it is much more decentralized than just the 12 witnesses. It's all full nodes. Um, and the witnesses um, that might look centralized, but they could, well, not, not very easily, but they can be replaced. Um, just a democratic process that users uh, participate in. So I, I actually really love that design because um, um, it, it, it may not be the most decentralized, but it's very practical, and uh, you you have you don't have the risk of having the stake in the native currency of the network. Where, for instance, if a token becomes worth more than the native currency, then you get into all kinds of security problems, and on Obyte that's impossible. Mm. So, because the stake is in the real world, um, the virtual world becomes much more secure. It, it that's what I mean when I say hybrid it's um, it's a really nice uh, well I mean there's there's trade-offs right like, like I said I mean the, the 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 real world stake I mean this is all real world right this is all mm -hmm. I mean if we, if we agree that cryptocurrencies are real money then this is all real world it's just there's there's a pseudo anonymous world which is the cryptocurrency world and then there's there's um, uh, a, a meat space world where there's there's real or there's known identities right there's there's identities based on government records central authorities right so there's the centralized yeah. world and there's the decentralized world but they're both in my view real world and um well, yeah, maybe it's like, just a like physical world yeah like i said there's in in my view um there's a trade-off in that you know people might not be incentivized to lose their their uh, their assets in the centralized incumbent world, right? Um, so, like maybe if they're willing to stake their house or something like that, right? That's that's interesting. But if someone is willing to incentivize an equivalent amount. Uh, as what you would describe as a real world stake in the value of that cryptocurrency um, in my view that's equivalent right like if if I can trade the cryptocurrency for fiat currency and it has that tradability and it has that that inherent that same liquid value that same usability or that same utility function then in my view it's it's irrelevant uh you know what whether we're we're using a newer system or uh, an incumbent system to track who owns what right it's just it's it's just a different well 
it, it's a different way of solving the same problem, but I, yeah. I think this is stronger because you can't just replace uh, reputation and uh, any kind of asset you can replace or buy or um, trade trade for something else, and that's mm -hmm. impossible with reputation. Mm. I think the beauty of the system is that uh, the stake is totally outside of control of the system. So you, you have a witness, and the witness uh, has no power over the network other than saying, I've seen this transaction or I haven't seen this transaction. That's it. Nothing more. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the reputation in the, in the physical world, let, let's call it that then, um, uh, has no way, uh, there is no link at all between them. So um, the, f from a security point of view, I, in my opinion, that's the most secure bond you can have. Mm. If they don't, they can't influence each other. Um, and users can decide if your reputation is tainted or damaged, they can replace you without uh, having any kind of impact on the network. If the witness doesn't want to be replaced, well, too, too bad, bad luck, you are going to get replaced. So it doesn't matter that you uh, became a bad actor because we can just replace you. Right. So now you've lost your reputation and you're not a witness anymore. Right. Without uh, even having the possibility to harm the network. Right. So I think, yeah, that's just a very um, clever design. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, there's maybe some differences of opinion there, but these these are um, these are implementation choices, right? There there would be a way there would be a way to to have a, a, a more decentralized, fully pseudo anonymous implementation of something like Obyte. It's just Obyte has done it in this way. But it's not. It's not. It's not a design issue. No, you could do that, but uh, I, I think it would become uh, less strong. But uh, it's definitely possible. Right. Right. Sure. Okay. I mean, the, the hybrids. Uh, you could even do a proof of work for transactions like Nano. Um, right. Or proof of stake. Or you could. You could. You, you could yeah. just have a different witnessing uh, system. But uh, another thing that that I'm curious about is when you talk about these full nodes. Do full nodes record every single transaction on the DAG? Yes, they do. Yeah, all of them. So if, of them. If, if this were to scale to something that was used internationally, um, you know, as as you know, a competitor to a major fiat currency, and let's say there was a thousand transactions per second or something like that, um, yeah. what would the storage requirements be for for anyone running a full node at that point? Yeah, they, they will be pretty steep, but um, uh, um, at the moment, uh, we're at about uh, um, a continuous uh, 30 TPS when you download the whole deck. Mm -hmm. uh, peak performance is uh, thousands of transactions per second. But uh, if you download the whole deck at once, then mm -hmm. it takes, uh, well, I don't know, a couple of days at 30 TPS continuously. Okay. Used to be 15, so we've made some improvements there already, mm -hmm. um, but it can quite easily be much more improved. It just hasn't been a focus uh, yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but you talked about sharding earlier and stuff like that has to be looked at as well, because um, right now the, the actual demand on the platform is like uh, 0 0.1 TPS. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not an actual problem. We have to work on it at the moment. It is on our radar and we will work on it. Um, but it's mostly a physical limitation of hardware where you run into. So uh, storage writing capacity, uh, RAM capacity, uh, mm -hmm. hard drive storage capacity. Um, but the beauty in Obyte is that you pay exactly one byte of currency for one byte of storage. So mm -hmm. that's it would become very popular. Mm -hmm. Then at some point, the, the price of bytes would just um, uh, change too. So it would become more expensive to store the same amount of data. Right. Now, but the, the, you know, the thing that, that I find interesting about DAGs is that it's, it's basically, it's an alternative sharding scheme, right? So is there like, uh, from what I was, what I understood, and I'm not an expert, uh, but from what I understood previously, um, in a DAG based uh, ledger or, or cryptocurrency implementation, there's no need for every node to have a complete record of the entire transaction history. Is that correct? 
Uh, well, it, that depends on design, but I, I'm also not the creator of the platform, so it, the questions like this, uh, Tony would be far better to answer them. Mm -hmm. But what I know is that um, uh, there is a thing called a skip list, um, mm -hmm. where uh, it's possible to just uh, skip 100 transactions at or 1,000 transactions at, Mm -hmm. And if that one is still correct, then you can assume that the other ones in between are also correct. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that is possible, but um, for a full node to function 100%, uh, uh, it, it needs the entire DAG. So I'm not, I'm not sure that is correct, uh, what you're saying, but I'm also not an expert on that, so I'll, I'll have to ask our founder, Tony, because uh, okay. I don't know for sure. All right. Well, I mean, that, that's, I think that's... Um yeah, I, I, I think the DAG doesn't require a, a full transaction history, but it would require each user to witness a certain percentage of all transactions. I'm not 100% sure, but that's, that's kind of what I, what I was made to understand, that, that this would be a, a, simpler, um, a simpler infrastructure to shard so that... Because obviously one of the major issues, especially in the Bitcoin space, is this whole, you know, stupid debate about block sizes, you know, mm -hmm. and people that think that they can, they can solve everything just by making the block size bigger. But then the problem with that is um, the storage requirement. And then, you know, if you increase the block size, then you reduce the number of people that can run a full node. Yeah. Like ten years of of Bitcoin history at one megabyte block sizes is already two hundred gigabytes. So, you know, um, if you increase, so now I, I understand that that Bitcoin Cash, for example, has a maximum theoretical block size of thirty two megs, which allows it to handle ninety six transactions per second. But that that doesn't solve the scalability issue, right? Like. Like if thousands, if, if millions upon millions upon millions of people wanted to use this, you would need something that can handle thousands of transactions per second, right? If there were, let's say, one billion users of Bitcoin, it would need to be able to do something on the order of, you know, maybe 10,000 transactions per second or something like that. So 96 transactions per second, you just increase the storage requirement, but you didn't solve the scalability issue. So. No, but I, I, I think, um, uh, but that's my personal opinion, we're, we're going about this in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it should become much more important what you decide to store on, uh, on a blockchain or on a DAG. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it shouldn't be possible to just dump everything on it with a, a thousand TPS. Mm -hmm. uh, you should have to make choices. Um, uh, DLT blockchain or, or a DAG should be one of the choices you have when you mm -hmm. want to store something. Mm -hmm. And if you need to have it decentralized, 100% secure, et cetera, et cetera, then that can come at a price. Mm -hmm. And you should be willing to pay the price for it. But in a lot of situations where people are trying to build stuff on the blockchain now, I think it's not needed at all. And a, a regular centralized database is good enough. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, especially all all of the payments uh, in the world uh, on blockchain, I uh, I never see that happening, and I I doubt the UX will be good enough to uh, replace uh, contactless payments, for instance, that are big here in the in the Netherlands. People just have to wave their card, and uh, bam, it's done. And right. you, you can't compete with that. And I I think we shouldn't compete with that. And um, I have to get back to hybrid again. I just don't believe in replacing all these systems with Bitcoin or some other currency. Mm -hmm. I think we work together and in places where it makes sense, use uh, decentralized solutions. And I think they can uh, scale up to that level so that a lot of people use decentralized solutions when they are... Um, actually needed. For instance, that's one of the examples I always give. Let's say your phone has a recording option mm -hmm. for video and audio so mm -hmm. that you can prove that the video or audio you're recording is authentic. This could be used by journalists and all it has to do is uh, post a hash of the recording uh, to the blockchain with a timestamp mm -hmm. and they can prove this is 100% uh, untampered video and it is made by me because my phone is also registered uh, on the blockchain with a unique ID.
Right. Now, I suddenly have uh, a way to prove that my eyewitness report is 100% authentic, made by me. Right. Um, but you don't have to store this whole video on the blockchain. That's, that's useless. Um, so we just have to think about what, well, you could also do that if you want to 100% make sure that nobody could ever uh, make it disappear. But then you would have to pay the price for it. You want 100% uh, unerasable vi video? Okay, this is the cost. Um, and I think once people start making more hybrid apps that only put the truly necessary stuff on a blockchain, um, yeah, th this will all be, uh, the, uh, uh, the whole scaling uh, issue uh, will be much smaller. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of the ideas that I've kind of been toying with is the idea of a VAT. So I know that Europeans seem quite comfortable with a 20% value added tax. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and here in Canada, you know, uh, we, we have, I think our harmonized sales tax, at least in Ontario is 13%. So, um, and you know, the idea that this, this VAT, you could, you could implement a cryptocurrency that would have just a, a large transaction fee, right, on all transactions. So the transactions cost a lot, but that, that those, those fees get redistributed equitably mm. uh, uh, into the community so that it's, it's, it, it creates something... Um, it increases the circulation of the currency simultaneously, which further enhances the value of the currency, right? Because the more people are using the currency, the more, the more people that have money to spend in that money, the more that your position in that kind of money has value, right? Obviously. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a mutually beneficial thing, but by, by adding a, a somewhat significant cost to each transaction, um, you're also minimizing the, the, you know, the risk that people would have, you know, um, like one unique wallet ID, one unique address for every transaction that they do and that they would have, you know, that they would flood the network with all, with, you know, tumbling transactions in order to anonymize them and doing all, all of this, this kind of nonsense that, uh, that, that, you know, just bloats the block size or bloats the, um, yeah the DAG history. So, so, um, but, but that, that also kind of creates a problem when it comes to uh, transaction anonymity. So we're familiar with, you know, zero knowledge proofs in, um, in, in Zcash. And we're also familiar with, you know, how Mimblewimble uh, kind of takes a lot of things off chain, which allows, uh, you know, enhanced uh, privacy capabilities of, of Mimblewimble style transactions. How do, uh, so what, what are the uh, privacy centric features of Obyte and how does that work? Well, uh, the native currency of Obyte bytes, mm -hmm. also sometimes called white bytes, they mm -hmm. are uh, just public, like Ethereum and Bitcoin. There's basically no privacy options attached there. Mm -hmm. So all transactions are public and everybody can look through the entire history of the DAG. Mm -hmm. um, and there is no privacy. Mm -hmm. But there is a second coin uh, called black bytes, and mm -hmm. those are 100% private, even more private than, uh, than Monero or Zcash or anything else. Mm -hmm. you, you can uh, see it as actual cash, like mm -hmm. coins and bills. Yeah. Send them directly to, to one another, including its entire history. Um, and that is never stored on the DAG itself. So only the spend proof is um, stored, but never mm -hmm. the actual transaction. Um, so th this is a 100% a uh, anonymous uh, asset, basically, on the Obyte platform. Um, yeah, called Black Bytes. So um, how does that work? How, how, how is it? How is it anonymized? I mean, because if there's no central authority, um, you know, how, like we understand the idea of zero knowledge proofs or, or taking some aspects of the transaction off chain, like Mimblewimble or, or Zcash. How does, how do black bytes work? If, if you can, I mean, if you know. 
No, I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is also, you, you would have to ask Tony this because okay. I'm not technical enough to, to explain. I wouldn't, right. wouldn't be able to tell you. That's fine. That's fine. Is there, is there a way to, um, to exchange white bytes for black bytes? Is that possible? Yeah, there is one exchange. Uh, it's now actually run by Mark de Measel, uh, one of the one of Bypol's early adopters, mm -hmm. um, and uh, th that's a, a a bot inside the wallet called mm -hmm. the Freebie Exchange, and there you can exchange white bytes for black bytes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, but you basically give up a little privacy there because mm -hmm. it's it's not one hundred percent trustless because the owner. Um, the owner of the exchange uh, gets has full visibility. Account. Yeah, obviously, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you send a peer to peer, that's impossible. Okay. So what what are the the you know in my view what I what I think is is missing from Bitcoin and Ethereum and and all of these cryptocurrencies right now is the ecosystem, right? That's kind of the thing that, that, that people are, are just don't seem to be working on. They're building a lot of very esoteric systems that other developers think are, are really mind blowing. But in terms of the killer app for, for the home user, where I just download a piece of software and run it on my laptop or on my phone and I use it, right? Um, what can people do with these, these systems right now is, the, 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 the end user applications are somewhat limited at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, you know, what would be great would be to build some kind of, of social network on top of something like IPFS. I don't know if you're familiar with IPFS. Yeah, I know a little bit about it. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's basically a, a decentralized shared hard drive. It's basically yeah. BitTorrent on steroids and you know if, if there was a social a fully decentralized social network where people could share files and 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 socialize and also have a, de a fully decentralized marketplace right so a decentralized um community uh forum and a decentralized market right with a coupled currency um, and, a, and a nice user interface that does all of these things. At that point, you have a pretty compelling ecosystem, right? Like if you could build, are, are you familiar with WeChat? Oh, yes. Yes, right. So it's a Chi WeChat is a, a Chinese chat application, but I mean, it does a lot more than chat, right? It has, yeah. you, you, have, you have chat, you have group chats, you have, um, moments where you can, you know, share status updates with your network. You have, uh, you have a marketplace. So you have like we Dien or, or we stores, uh, where you can buy and sell things. You can order a taxi, you can book a flight, you can yeah. do pretty, pretty much everything. Like WeChat, WeChat is almost an operating system and WeChat is, is, is hurting Apple quite severely in China because most people or many Chinese people just live inside WeChat. So there's not a tremendous value add for, you know, things like, um, like in the West here, you know, one of the major reasons why people like, like iOS is because of iMessage and, and some of the other Apple specific uh, services and functionality. But a lot of Chinese people, they just live inside WeChat. So, mm -hmm. so WeChat is kind of becoming sort of like an operating system. And I feel like that's what's missing from the crypto space. It's, it's, it's a, almost like a WeChat style operating system that people can, can operate in completely. And people are, are focusing way too much on just the currency instead of creating a fully decentralized ecosystem that that allows people to share files pseudo anonymously and allows people to um to buy and sell things pseudo anonymously and allows people to socialize pseudo anonymously right in a fully decentralized and censorship resistant way um 
Yeah, I, I think all of the things you mentioned are being built separately. But yeah. Nobody's uh, all integrating them into one thing. Yeah. Um, what, what, what we're trying to do with Obite is that you, inside the wallet, you have this bot store, mm -hmm. and there you have all these different apps or bots that mm -hmm. you can use, and um, that, that, that is somewhat an ecosystem. You can also chat with other users, and you can pair your device with another device, and you can have private chat encrypted. Mm -hmm. So we, we are doing some of the stuff you mentioned, um, but um, yeah, I think it could still be a lot better and more integrated, but, uh, but it's, um, uh, yeah, often it, it, people uh, compare this with the beginning of the internet, and I do all the time as well. Mm -hmm. It's just everybody's building intranets, like yeah. you did back then. Everybody's building in their own closed circle, and that's going to change. I mean, uh, but it, it'll take time. And uh, I, I think you're totally right. We do need stuff like that, but everybody's still figuring out what technologies to use. Um, I think, uh, uh, well, I'm beginning to think more and more that this is going to take even longer than, than the internet because it's so much harder to program for it. The internet had a very easy language called HTML and mm -hmm. everybody could pick it up within a week and then you could start building. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, definitely not the case with blockchain. You, you just, well, you, you, if you want to learn Solidity, well, good luck. It'll take you at least a couple months um, and with Obite, it's easier because it's all based on Node.js, uh, but mm -hmm. still, um, yeah, it, it just takes a lot more time. Um, and and uh, that's why I think that the whole adoption of uh, crypto-enabled solutions is going to take uh, quite a bit longer than people expect. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it is going to happen. It just takes a long time. Um, and, and an ecosystem like that, that comes after that. So first, we need a couple of successful single purpose apps mm -hmm. and hopefully one killer app because i i 100 agree there is, there is no killer app at the moment it's just mm -hmm. value transfer that's basically all those networks are used for yeah um and and order uh, again that in my opinion that is a killer app but nobody still nobody uses it mm -hmm. um so yeah it, it, it's going to take a long time yeah, the thing that's most exciting that's happening right now, or that, that I'm really waiting for, is um, is uh, the new Open Bazaar mobile client, which is called Haven. Um, so Open Bazaar is uh, is building, and I spoke to Brian Hoffman, yes. um, and that was that that was a very interesting conversation, and he's actually working on uh, exactly that. He's trying to build a decentralized WeChat, you know, something where it's, yeah. it's something that you can live inside and, and do everything in and something that's fully decentralized. So that's, yeah. you know, that's, that's yeah, exciting. The, yeah. One, one of the things, uh, I, I hope for is that people with unique talents mm -hmm. are someday going to require, uh, whatever currency it may be, but just, they want to be paid only in that currency for their unique skill. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, in my opinion, the fastest way to adoption. If you have a unique skill, you say, I only want to be paid in Bitcoin, or I only want to be paid in bytes. Um, then that creates demand um, for unique skills. Um, and uh, yeah, but people have to have the courage to do that. They have right. to, yeah. And um, that takes, uh, yeah, a lot of courage. That, that's why you don't see people do it. But if you have a very easy to use mobile app where you can just offer your services and put your price in and people can just book you through their phone and it's automatic, yeah, then the user experience is good enough, then that might actually happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, what, 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 is, what, is, uh, what is the roadmap? for Obite? What's going on with Obite? What, what are you guys working on? What's coming out next? What are, what are the new features that, that, that you're excited about? What are, and, and what are you generally most excited about in, in the crypto space right now? Yeah, so we finally actually, uh, yesterday, uh, our foundation in Liechtenstein was established. Mm -hmm. We've been working on that for a long time, so we now finally have a legal entity. Mm -hmm. uh, from where we can work. So that's uh, pretty important. And uh, we've been working on a new wallet version for about, well, a couple of months already. Uh, finally doing the rebranding. The wallet is still called Byteball, etc. It's going to be Obyte. And we'll have a new um, 
uh, identity attestation method uh, in it that we're quite excited about. And uh, we have uh, quite some things going on business development wise um, uh, in Japan and uh, in the US and in Spain. But no, nothing I can announce yet, but uh, some pretty interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there is this new game on Steam called Drug Wars uh, that uses a, a token that uh, was um, uh, a, a token on Obite. Uh, mm -hmm. We're getting a lot of new users from that at the moment. It's also very exciting. Okay. And uh, we have uh, a university in Denmark uh, building uh, a website for a charity project that we're doing. It's mm -hmm. also uh, quite interesting. Um, what else? Uh, we're decentralizing, trying to. So I talked about witnesses already. We only have one decentralized uh, witness at the moment. And uh, we have a couple of candidates, uh, well, lined up, as you say, that mm -hmm. we're going to introduce to the community in the coming weeks and months. Mm -hmm. So we're working there uh, as well. And uh, we're going to, well, now that we feel the foundation, we're going to professionalize the whole structure and hire some more people in the development team, um, marketing as well. So we're going to, yeah, uh, grow the team. Um, and, um, well, we're going to a lot more hackathons, uh, youthathons is what we call them, um, events like that. So we have a lot of stuff in the works. Okay. And um, what I'm most excited about in, in the whole crypto space, uh, I have to say, Two things I'm really excited about is still Augur, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm mentioning it again, but also a related project called uh, Melonport. Mm -hmm. uh, they do uh, fund management on chain mm -hmm. and they recently, basically the, the people that build it have now given the whole project to the, to the open source community mm -hmm. uh, to further, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, develop it. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a very interesting project as well. Yep. Um, and uh, other than that, well, I did a Dutch one that I really like. Uh, they're doing, it's called Get Protocol. Mm -hmm. They're doing fair ticketing and uh, it's, it's all a really nice solution. And they al already have uh, big clients in the Netherlands. They, yeah, they're, they're using a, an Ethereum wallet in the background, but they have like 10,000s of people already using an Ethereum wallet without them knowing. So they, they have a really brilliant app um, that I like. And it's, mm -hmm. um, well, it's, it's one of the most straightforward uh, blockchain use cases, but still uh, it works. Okay. Uh, yeah. Those are a couple of things. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd, I'd love to, um, to talk to your, your, um, your, your colleague, uh, Tony, that you mentioned a few times about some of the more technical questions that I had. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, because um, you know, I, I, I'm specifically interested in in how the uh, the, the 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 black byte transactions work, the the anonymous or the private transactions, and also yeah. um, you know the the roadmap for scaling, because that's the thing. I mean, if there's no roadmap for scaling, like we know what Ethereum is doing, they're working on Casper and they're trying to shard to have yeah. you know kind of a central blockchain with a bunch of different side chains so that no single full node is going to have to have a, a complete transaction history of everything so i feel like i feel like that's that's fairly interesting but i i you know the thing that got me interested in in dags was the the idea that it's it's just a different approach for sharding so that each full node doesn't have to have a complete transaction history of every single transaction that ever took place in in that particular cryptocurrency. So that's, um, you know, I, I kind of want to uh, to learn a little bit more about that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I could say some things about it, but it's probably most likely right. not correct. So it's yeah. far better to to have an interview with Tony as well and let him explain because yeah, he basically coded it all. So. If he can't answer it, then nobody can. So, perfect. All right. So, was there um, was there anything else that you wanted to cover? Uh, no, I think we covered pretty much. It's already uh, what is it? More than an hour. We we talked yeah. quite a lot. Lovely, lovely. Well, I I really appreciate you making the time, and uh, yeah, thanks again. Have a nice day. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.